Welcome to Keeping the World Company on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Shay Fidel. Today, we're going to talk about how the NATO and EU organizations have changed. Will they be reliable for Europe, for the U.S. going forward? Our co-host for the show is Tim Apicella. Our esteemed guest for the show is Manfred Henningsen, Emeritus Professor in political science at UH Manoa. Welcome to the show, you guys. You know, we seem to get a flood of news about Europe and uh, about the two wars that are going on in and around Europe and, and the autocrats that are developing and the strange political processes that are happening there. And you have to wonder, you know, just how strong NATO is. Did Trump attack NATO? Have they fully recovered? Germany is strong, but is France strong? We have autocrats like Viktor Orban in Hungary happening and others. Um, we have we have changes, many changes. There's nothing so constant as change itself. And the question, you know, that we're going to discuss today is how have these changes affected NATO and its efficacy and the, U, the EU and its efficacy? So let's start with you, Manfred. Um, you just came back from a trip recently. You must have some idea about how things have changed and whether NATO and the EU are the same as they were, or maybe they have a different future, you know, different than we would have imagined. Can you talk about it? NATO has become stronger uh, as a result of the Putin threat and the membership of Finland and Sweden. So in, in that sense, you could say the future for NATO uh, is at this point, strong, what would happen if Trump becomes uh, president? And as some people are alluding, he will take the United States out of the organization. Uh, I don't know. Sometimes I think uh, it may even more strengthen uh, NATO, the European part of NATO, including Canada. Uh, but I, I, I don't want to speculate about that. With regard to the EU, Yes, you mentioned Viktor Orban, and uh, it seems yesterday, you know, there was a confrontation in the European Parliament between the president of the commission, Ursula von der Leyen, and Orban. She attacked him after he had given a speech defending his uh, position. But uh, the opposition leader uh, in Hungary, uh, who initially belonged to Orban's party, attacked Orban also. So in, in the last elections, you know, he got up to, they got up to 30%. So what you have here is a warning to Orban, not only from the EU, but uh, from within his own country, that his time may be limited. So in that sense, I think what you are confronted with is uh, a NATO that is not uh, safe, completely safe, uh, because of the threat of the American elections. I still think Trump will not win, but nevertheless, if he would win, uh, it would be uh, dangerous. But uh, the EU is in relatively good shape, even though you have now uh, Germany <clears throat> uh, closing its borders to some countries because they are not taking back as they should as a result of an agreement, a Dublin agreement, um, migrants who have checked in to the EU through their countries. Uh, so how long this German uh, closure of some borders will last, people don't know. Scholz, the chancellor, has indicated that it is a limited closure. Uh, so what you have uh, there are some tensions within the EU, not only with regard to Orban, but uh, with regard uh, to manage the migration influx from um, Asia, well, Africa, North Africa, and Latin America, but especially from the African continent, from North Africa down to, to <clears throat> South Africa. Uh, I think 
they will manage to come to an agreement. Um, so in that regard, I do not think the European Union is in trouble, even though some countries are in economic trouble because they have huge budget deficits. France is the leader, but there are others that have uh, similar high deficits. And uh, the European Union has been warning them that uh, they have to take care of these huge budget uh, deficits. So in that regard, it, I think there are some uh, problems within the EU, uh, but Ursula von der Leyen, the president of the commission, I think is very strong. Her position is very strong. And there is something else which is very interesting. You know, there was an interview in a German newspaper with two Israelis, one Jewish, one Palestinian, um, saying that uh, the two-state solution for Palestine is dead. What we need now is a, a solution that resembles the uh, European Union, uh, meaning a confederation. Uh, now, that is a very intriguing idea because, after all, you know, you have in, 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 in the state of Israel 9 million people living, 7 million uh, Jewish Israelis and 2 uh, million Arab Israelis. I think 1.2 million of them are Israeli citizens. And these two people, one is a... His name is uh, Berm. He teaches at the New School in New York, uh, but he is an Israeli also. Uh, and the other one is a Palestinian researcher, a woman from Jerusalem. And both of their uh, ideas, I mean, the ideas that both have together are very intriguing about uh, this confederated Palestine that they are envisioning down the road, it will not come immediately, even if it would become uh, launched. But the tensions that still exist between the two parts who in, in which you have genocidal tendencies, you know, in the in the uh, Arab side, in the Palestinian side, and you have uh, these uh, expulsion tendencies that sometimes border on genocide also in the on the Israeli, the Israeli conservative, the radical conservative side. Uh, so you have a very, very a troubling situation in that regard. But I think this model that they are using is a very intriguing one. Um, now, they are not talking about uh, a confederation being uh, based on a constitution. Um, remember, the, the European Union doesn't have a constitution. Uh, they, one of the commission presidents, Giscard d'Estaing, the former French president, tried to uh, introduce one in 2000. And five, but uh, plebiscites in Holland and in France rejected that project. So what you have now is a situation that uh, resembles Great Britain, which doesn't have a constitution either, um, and has managed, you know, has been managing its existence. The four parts: England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland for quite some time relatively successfully. Um, and this success uh, certainly exists also in the European Union. And using that as a model for a post two state solution for Palestine is a very intriguing is a very intriguing idea. Well, when you say intriguing, Manfred, it sounds like you think it might be a good idea. Yes, I think it is a good idea because uh, the stalemate, you know, between these two <clears throat> that try to kill each other um, or tell, I mean, Israeli, the conservatives want to get rid of 
the uh, Palestinians that are living living there in a way you have the idea of a second a second Nakba, you know, the expulsion of Palestinians that happened in 1948. Um, and that certainly will not be tolerated by the international community. So what you are confronted with here is, it seems, an unmanageable situation. You're going off the track here. Um, and, and not only that, but I, I disagree with some of your characterizations. But but OK, let's, let's talk about um, the question, which is, how have NATO and the EU changed? Will they be reliable organizations going forward? What I, what I get from what you've said so far is that there are stresses and strains on both organizations. Um, there is, uh, of course, uh, the, the wars, the Ukraine war, which you really haven't mentioned much, and, and the Middle Eastern war, which is certainly a point of contention among various members of NATO and the EU. And of course, the economies of some of the countries involved in NATO and the EU. And of course, Trump and the possibility of uh, what might be a disastrous result in the American elections in three or four weeks from now. These are pressures on NATO. They are pressures on the EU. And so, I mean, if you are advancing the notion <laughs> that everything is just fine, things will carry on the way they've carried on, NATO will be NATO, the EU will be the EU. Uh, that, that doesn't seem to comport with all these pressures that are being applied from all these problems on Europe. I think with the EU is safe, uh, is not troubled by Trump. Uh, after all, the US is not member of the EU. So for that reason, forget about uh, that as an issue for the survival of and the health of the European Union. The problems for the European Union are internal ones, uh, the Orban issue uh, and the budgetary issues that you have and economic issues that you have in France and uh, some of uh, the other countries, including uh, Germany, but to a lesser extent. But NATO, I mean, NATO is threatened by the American elections in less than three weeks, on three weeks. Mm, that's what I'm saying. This is a pressure on NATO. NATO, I would, if I were a member of NATO or if I were NATO organizationally, I'd be very concerned about the, the election of Trump. He's yes. already said he wants, to, he wants to cut funding and he wants NATO to go away. And right. we have found recently that he's more friendly with Putin than we thought. Right. And Putin doesn't like NATO at all. And then you have the migrant problem. You have these arguments among various leaders about going right, going left. Uh, Macron is on a tear about uh, about doing a uh, um, an embargo on arms and support to Israel. Other countries don't feel the same way. You have the report from MI5 uh, in, in Britain uh, uh, pointing out that... Uh, that Russia and, for that matter, Iran have been involved in a number of, of plans and plots um, to do violence on the streets of Britain over the past couple of years. That's right now. Um, you have lots of um, contentions and arguments and debates and protests. And I mean, it seems like it's everywhere. I, I can't believe with all this trouble and with the migrants and, and people, the reaction of people to the migrants that NATO is as reliable as it was, and the EU is reliable going forward. Furthermore, I'd like to add that Turkey is a very strange member of NATO. Turkey is now claiming it wants to do an intifada against Israel, and Turkey is a kind of a rogue nation turning further and further right. When Turkey was admitted to NATO, you know, it was, um, it was a big argument. It was a dispute as to whether it should be admitted. And a lot of people, a lot of countries felt it shouldn't be because it was a, a very strange leadership under Erdogan. So, you know, all these things seem to undermine the integrity of those two organizations. Tell no, me no. I'm wrong, Manfred. Yeah, you're wrong, especially when it comes to the European Union. You're, you're absolutely wrong. Uh, the European Union, I think, is solid. 
and the problems that uh, the that I mentioned uh, are problems that, however, can be solved. Now you have you you mentioned uh, the war in, in the Middle East, and uh, you mentioned Macron's uh, recommendation to stop delivering weapons to Israel. Well, look, the image of Israel at this point is not a very good one. But we're not here to argue that. We're no, here to I identify it plays, it plays the contention the between the members of NATO and the members of the EU. Macron says this, but a lot of other countries say that. And so what you have is a difference of opinion on a major policy point. Yes. How can they be how can they be um in solidarity let me let me let me go to uh tim tim what do you think about these things well i want to switch a little bit about nato because the title is how they've changed and uh manford uh you know nato in 1949 had a 12 country membership that has expanded to 32 nations uh with bosnia and georgia and ukraine desirous of becoming a nato member country <clears throat> now when when putin invaded ukraine one of Putin's main talking points, which has been adopted by the United States mega Republicans and conservatives, was that because of the expansion of NATO on Russia's borders, that prompted Putin to invade Ukraine. Uh, what about Putin's uh, argument that the expansion of NATO is the catalyst to the Ukraine invasion, or one of the major points of catalyst to the Ukraine invasion. He has made it quite clear that for him, the most dramatic event in the 20th century is the collapse of the Soviet Union. And he wants to restore this imperial uh, realm that uh, you know was not only the Soviet Union, but Tsarist Russia. So, and Ukraine belonged at one point well, it belonged to the Soviet Union, uh, but it belonged also to Tsarist uh, uh, Russia. But uh, the Soviet Union collapsed in the 90s, and the 15 member states, including Russia, became independent states, and Ukraine also became an independent uh, state. And what you have in the Ukraine, you know, since uh, it became independent, is an incredibly strong civil society. I saw that when I was traveling in, in the Ukraine. Uh, and they will not give up their freedom. And part of the freedom is that they can apply for membership. Uh, and that's how they see it in NATO and the European Union. They are a candidate for membership in the European Union, like uh, six or seven other states, you know, in, especially in the Balkans. Um, Georgia is also an applicant for membership in the European Union. I mean, the European Union has now 27 member states, uh, and uh, it has, you know, grown since the collapse of the Soviet Union because uh, a lot of uh, states, you know, that also belonged to the Soviet Union, like the Baltic well, states. Let me, let me go back to the question, Manfred. Well, I, uh, how has NATO changed? Yes, we know the history, but the question is, um, you have various differing opinions by different countries in Europe about whether Putin has a legitimate claim or not. And uh, and I know how I feel, but uh, some of them are a little confused. Germany well, has this. Uh, Merzheimer, this, this, I mean, uh, the, the American political scientist Merzheimer has made this argument again and again, and I think he's wrong uh, that the NATO, uh, I mean, the membership of Poland, uh, the Czech Republic, and well, certainly now, uh, Finland and Sweden, uh, that is the decision of these countries. And one giving Putin, so to, so to speak, the, the right to block 
their free actions is uh, absolutely insane. Okay, but there are some organizations within Germany, a political party, we talked about that. Uh, Viktor Orban is going to support Putin. Right. Um, I think that Macron has a problem um, with, you know, a contending right-wing group that's growing in France. And yes. so the question that I'm asking you to look at this, you know, the next election cycle in these countries, uh, and I think in, in the low countries, uh, the, in Holland, there are similar organizations that like Putin. And whether that's social media, whether it's Putin's attempts to undermine their, you know, their political interests, um, the fact is they don't agree. And they don't feel the same way that uh, Sweden and Finland feel. Um, and when you get down to the crunch, whether Ukraine is a member of NATO or probably not a member of NATO, when you get down to the crunch, NATO has internecine arguments going on about this critical issue. Can it be relied on going forward? Remember, Putin is doing everything he can to undermine the resolve of NATO, everything he can, every day. You still believe that NATO can function in a crisis? Yes. Uh, huh. I mean, look, the major crisis for NATO will be who will become the next president of the United States. But even if Trump should become president, I think the internal, the domestic opposition within the U.S. against uh, the U.S. leaving NATO will be so strong that he will not be able of pulling that off. But irrespective of that, I do not think that uh, NATO's survival is threatened. And certainly I'm not, not the... talking about NATO's survival, Manfred. Oh, it's I'm fun. talking about whether it will act in accordance with Section 5 Yes. If anything happens, if a crisis emerges, whether it can be, be relied upon as it was 5, 10, 15 years ago. Well, NATO, well, look, NATO member state supported the U.S. Uh, in Afghanistan as the result uh, of Article 5. Um, you know, France uh, and Germany uh, sent troops, Denmark sent troops. And not in the Iraq war. Germany was uh, and France were against it. But in Afghanistan, they uh, followed uh, strictly the article that when a member state becomes attacked from the outside, uh, they uh, will be uh, loyal uh, supporters. So I do not look. I've, I, what I hear you saying, Manfred, is that if Trump is elected, NATO cannot be relied on. Am I right? Well, no, no. Is that what, NATO can is that be what you're saying? No. NATO, NATO can be relied on, but it will have some problems, you know, with having an American president who is unreliable. Um, and it will depend on the rest of the American political class uh, that will become the result of the elections. We are not only electing a president, electing Congress. Uh, what will happen internally, domestically in the U.S. But, I mean, I would separate the reliability of NATO from the reliability of the EU, uh, because I think the European Union will survive uh, Trump, whatever he may want to do. Now, whether the EU will admit... But is the EU as important to the future of Europe as NATO is? Yes, it is maybe even more important, because, look, you have to remember... The EU uh, was initially designed, I mean, following uh, the European economic community and what have you, uh, to become a, a kind of republic, you know, in a way to follow the American process from uh, the post declaration of independence period until they got a constitution. Uh, but you have had then still some troublesome issues, you know, within the U.S. that came into being. And then the Civil War didn't solve them, made it worse. So No, in uh, fact, in fact, remember Greece? Remember Greece? How it was a failed nation economically? Did that ever get resolved? And there are a number of yeah, Balkan got, countries in similar got, circumstances. It got resolved. And, and if the EU is largely economic, common market, that sort of thing. If yes. these countries are failing or fail, but they, but and Greek, have to be bailed out every time you turn around. That's not good for the EU. 
well, look, the, the Greek crisis has been resolved. And I think the French crisis and all the other crises, the economic crises that uh, people are talking about in Europe will be solved also. I have no doubts about that. But the political pros uh, prospect, you know, that uh, was part of the design, the original design, and it was in a way mishandled by Giscard d'Estaing, you know, the, the French president who uh, uh, sent, uh, I don't know, an 800 or 700 page document to all voters in France uh, it, for the plebiscite, this idiotic uh, strategy, you know, it killed it, but it, it killed it in, 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 in Holland also, and it would have been killed in Denmark. But what you have now is a confederation, but a confederation that has become stronger and not weaker. Why do you say that? The confederation is uh, is in sort of a, a fragmentation. They no, don't agree a, with each other. You've got no, a couple not. of countries there that have internal problems of major magnitude, which are being stoked by our friend Putin. So well, uh, you so feel that the they're open, stronger now? Yes, because uh, they have been in existence for a, a long period of time. And the problem with Auburn, you know, Auburn needs the European money. The, the European Union has pulled 200 million uh, euros on hold that Auburn needs. Uh, and if he does not behave in the way, you know, the uh, European Parliament, the Commission expects him to behave in the future, uh, he will lose his but power. If they're, if they're in an argument making threats with Orban, it doesn't sound like it's um, peaceful and uh, reliable and uh, integrated. It sounds more like they have an argument going on. So uh, let me let me ask you, Tim, your, your thoughts about this. Do you want to jump in on any of this? I do agree with Manfred that, um, you know, either through Trumpism, uh, NATO and the EU have become more unified. They've realized what was at stake. And certainly Joe Biden had a great role and, and he did so very quickly, which I was amazed on how he was able to take a, a more or less a fragmented NATO that was, you know, as Trump was trying to pull the wings apart on, and he was able to unify them. Uh, it was amazingly quick and swift. I thought it was gonna take years of you know, diplomacy and, and, and reassure NATO that the United States was a trusted partner. And Joe Biden did it within a matter of months. And it was really amazing. The question is, um, to what degree does that unification or that, that spirit of unification continue on in light or in lieu of Donald Trump ever becoming the 47th president? I think it, in, when it comes to the European Union, I think it would uh, make it even stronger. How about uh, NATO? NATO, you know, the only two NATO members, the other two NATO members that are nuclear weapons, Great Britain and France, only France is member state of the EU. So the nuclear uh, umbrella that Germany, for example, lived under will have to be become a French uh, umbrella. And that may become uh, a problem, but I do not think that the U.S. will go as far as uh, this leave NATO. Uh, I think the conservative resistance within the country of the political class that has not lost its mind uh, will be very, very strong. Um, so for that, well, remember, remember, we had this news only a, a day or two ago um, about uh, how Trump was making secret telephone calls recently, within the last couple of years, to his friend Putin. Right, um, and he's also said that he would solve the Ukraine problem on day one. Yes, uh, and probably by surrendering Ukraine. Yeah, this, he this is not good for NATO. It's it certainly would be against the the wishes of NATO and the the you know the countries in NATO. So uh, you know I th what you said before uh, to me really resonates, and that is if Trump is elected, NATO and the EU have a problem because no, the EU does not. The EU, the EU has not. You always confuse the two. 
uh, NATO will have a problem, but I think the major problem will be the respectability of the United States in the world. If Trump becomes president, the global image of this country will be really damaged tremendously. And if he should follow, you know, what 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 would indicates in this new book uh, that he would follow up on, uh, you know, leaving NATO. Uh, it will be a damage to the identity of this country and the political, the military uh, identity of this country that is cannot be healed. So, and that's okay, well, let it. me let me go. That takes us to the, really the last area of discussion today, and that is um, Manfred. If if you were the Secretary of State under whatever administration it is. And and you had, you know, the, the, the ear of the president, so to speak, and you were asked to fashion a foreign policy um, dealing with NATO and the EU, uh, making them, you know, as strong as possible, as reliable as possible uh, under whatever crisis might emerge. What would your policy be? And Tim, I'll be asking you the same question in a moment. Well, I would uh, encourage the, the European member states, uh, especially uh, Germany, but others as well, to follow up on their arguments that they made, you know, the Zeitenwende argument, that they have to beef up the military. Germany has done it to a very small extent, but not to the extent that is really necessary. And the German defense minister, Pistorius, has been very clear about it. Now he is handed, you know, discussed as a successor for Scholz. If Scholz should uh, not become the candidate for chancellor in the elections next year, Pistorius will be, and he will is a strong supporter of NATO and the military beaving up, you know, of uh, the the German military uh, system. So in in uh, but what the the Americans, I think, would have to somehow assist these tendencies without the threats that uh, you know Trump was throwing around, you know, um, saying that Putin can do whatever he wants to do, you know, with the members of the Euro, uh, the NATO if they don't take care of themselves. I mean, that threat may have helped. Yeah, it but I if think, you were the Secretary of State, Manfred. Yeah, I would. Uh, how would how would you deal with the question of including Ukraine in NATO? How would you deal uh, with the question of uh, dealing with Turkey, kind of a rogue member of NATO, and for that matter, Viktor Orban? How would you deal with Norway, which is not a member of NATO? Would you try to expand NATO? Well, yes, and I think uh, the tendencies in Norway go back and forth as they did in um, the three other Scandinavian countries, in, and it also in Iceland. Uh, mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think the the te look the Viktor Orban problem will be solved within Hungary. Whether Ukraine should become a member state of NATO immediately. I do not know. I think they should become a member state of the European Union, and they should uh, admit it to the EU, EU as quickly as possible. Should they, they should do the same with Moldova and uh, Georgia uh, and some of the, the other states that are on the list of applicants. With Turkey, I think they should not touch what I mean, follow your recommendation. Um, Turkey is <clears throat> too important in in connection, you know, with the Middle East. So for that reason, uh, I think um, American foreign policy should try to do everything to hold the European coalition with Canada together, uh, hold off on the membership of the Ukraine, but include all of the others that want uh, to become members. And uh, the EU should admit the Ukraine 
Uh, and that will threaten, I think, uh, Putin's um, stand even more than membership in uh, in okay, NATO. Let me go to Tim on these things. Tim, if you were the Secretary of State, um, what would you do? Well, first off, I'd request that I need a, an emergency flight to Aruba because of diplomatic issues. Number two <laughs> is, um, regarding Ukraine, I'd say, look, we don't have to get Ukraine into NATO to build them up militarily. Uh, look, look at the difference, uh, what we have for 50 plus years, 60 years between North Korea and South Korea. Uh, you can build up and have a, a great demilitarized zone, the 49th parallel, if you wish, um, between the two, you know, between Russia and Ukraine. They don't have to become a NATO country. Uh, yes, economically, they're going to need to be completely rebuilt. And, and that probably is a good candidate for the uh, EU. Although other EU nations say now we have to, you know, bear the burden of that cost. And uh, we're not so happy about that. Um, you know, that, that will rear its ugly head as an issue. But the bottom line is um, expansion of NATO is going to be tenuous at best because you're going to, as long as Putin is the leader of Russia, it's going to be a bigger and bigger issue. And it may, may spur on more conflict. And, and Putin will use it as his basis or his genesis to, to maybe invade other Baltic nations and use that as his springboard, as an excuse for doing so. So uh, that's what I would say to the president if I was secretary of, you know, um, and, 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 and start there. Okay, last words. Manfred, can you give us one minute on what you would leave with our audience on these various issues? on yep. uh, whether NATO and the EU have changed? Are they still reliable? Yes, they are still reliable. And I think you should not overestimate Putin's power. Uh, I mean, he is getting older, uh, even though it doesn't see show on his face, but he is in his 70s now. And uh, the political and economic condition in, in Russia is not uh, extraordinary. Um, and there's a lot of resentment uh, of him as well. So I, I mean, this characterization of Putin as the strong man who is invincible, you know, and has the world in his hand, I think is a misconception of uh, Putin's power. Uh, I mean, this is in a way, an egomaniac like uh, Trump. And the, that's why they correspond to each other, with each other. And, and... <laughs> okay, Tim, your last words? Uh, again, I, I'm going to have to agree with Manfred is that I think the viability of the EU is, is strong and will continue to be strong. Um, I think NATO had goes through some growing pains here if, if Trump becomes the 47th president. Um, I think once the Ukraine war or the invasion I won't call it a war, I'll call it the Ukraine invasion by Russia and Putin. Uh, once that's been resolved, I think there will be some conflicts about who's going to foot the bill to rebuild it. Um, I'm thinking of the EU's hesitancy uh, when Greece went financially bankrupt, when Spain was bankrupt, when Italy was bankrupt, due to the financial instruments of 2008, 2009, the uh, mortgage-backed security blow up. Um, it's a it's a heavy bill to pay, and they're not going to be too happy about it. But uh, I think they get through this, and I think EU will continue to strive and, and 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 prosper. Maybe the growth won't be as robust as it has been in the past, and I think NATO will will hobble along. And maybe they stop at membership at 32 countries for now. Uh, maybe they get 33. Maybe Norway does come into the fold. Maybe Bosnia. Who knows? Uh, I doubt Georgia. Uh, that's, that will be an unpleasant topic. So um, I agree with Medford. How about that? It's okay. It's all right. Uh, and I want to <laughs> add this before we close. Is a friend of mine just took a trip, which I thought was very courageous of him and his wife, um, to go to Eastern Europe, to the Baltics, to visit um, uh, not Ukraine, but uh, uh, Lithuania, uh, Latvia, Estonia. And they talked not... to the young... They, okay. I'm sorry? No, go ahead. And they talked to the young people there. And uh, they came back with a report that the young people were optimistic. They were all stoked on democracy. 
They were, they felt that they were in a democracy. They were not inclined to give it up. Uh, they liked Western Europe. They saw themselves as part of Western Europe. Um, and uh, it's not that they were terrified of Putin, but they were happy in the fact that they were not part of Russia. And um, that was encouraging. So maybe maybe Manfred, at least in some way, is right on the future of this. Uh, and we'll see. We'll follow up. We'll know more about it. And I hope to discuss it with you guys further as we get closer to the election and as we get, if we ever do, if we get beyond the election. Thank you very much, Manfred. Manfred Henningsen and uh, my co-host, Tim Apicella. A very interesting discussion. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Thanks to our viewers for watching. Aloha. Mm -hmm.